Yeah. So it's just going to take a minute or so to upload the slides, I guess. Okay. All right, so I think um, you should all be able to see the slides now. Um, yes, we can see. Okay. Right. Okay. All right, perfect. So this is great. Now, um, before I go into slides, I just want to request all the students, if you can, there's no pressurizing, but if you can, um, I would really appreciate if you can turn on your cameras. That way, I at least can see people and it doesn't look like I'm talking to the screen. Uh, you know, if you can, you know, I mean, it's no pressure. Uh, all right, so, um, you know, when uh, I Dr. want Falson, to talk... I just want to yes. refer for one thing. Some students, yes. some, they have uh -huh. a little bit of connectivity problem. So maybe okay. some of them only may not be able and otherwise, yes, yes, please, all of all of you, please turn on your videos if you don't have connectivity problem. Okay. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, this actually just helps a little bit. Otherwise, it, <laughs> these days, everybody is so much in front of the screen that I try to not speak to my screen a lot. So, um, okay. So, you know, when I go and talk at places about research and stuff like this, I feel that everybody is um, different and everybody's experience is different because our disciplines are different. People come from different backgrounds and then, you know, the universities are different and then your supervisors are different. Their personalities are different. So I don't think there is a formula for success in your thesis or in your dissertation or in publication. It's not like, um, uh, Nando sauce, right? Where you can go to even a supermarket and buy the sauce and eat it with chicken and feel the taste is good. It's not like that. Everybody have got their own experience. Now, um, that's why I really like to say whatever I'm going to discuss today, these are my own experiences, but then also my observations. So experiences are things that uh, happen to me as a PhD student. Um, and then my observations are things that did not happen to me, but I observed them happening to other people. So um, I just figure that, you know, the more we talk about these things, the better it is. So um, I'm going to skip a little bit of my um, own bragging about myself, it, uh, but I'll um, a little bit about uh, my background, right? So, like Dr. Farzana graciously, um, you know, introduced me. I I got my PhD from um, IBS, AHIBS at that time it was uh, IBS. So in 2015. Uh, before that, I was in UK for my masters. Um, and while I was in masters in UK, I had a lot of Malaysian friends who actually inspired me to come to Malaysia for PhD. So that's how I came to Malaysia for PhD. Uh, I'm originally from Pakistan, so my undergraduate is from Pakistan. And then right now I have um, close to 100 um, something papers plus conference papers. Uh, and my research area is hospitality and tourism market. Uh, when I started at IBS, I don't think there was anybody who was working in hospitality and tourism. I, I don't think even now there are many people working in that area. Um, the only difference is that um, when I say hospitality and tourism, it's not the applied field. Rather, I was in marketing, so I was working on consumer behavior in hospitality and tourism. And then um, the other thing that I did was in Malaysia. So again, if you see on the slide, it shows advanced statistics and SEM as uh, one of my research areas. And that's true. So I work on SEM. I work on several papers related to research methods. And I have also worked with, um, you know, you know, the developers of Smart PLS. Maybe some of you know Christian Ringel and Marco says that I've worked with them um, as on papers and projects and stuff like this. Um, and again, I say that, you know, even though Malaysia is a developing country, maybe many people still question why are we in Malaysia studying, right? I must tell you one thing that, you know, if you are in Malaysia, you have a, such a good opportunity to develop yourself as a researcher because um, honestly, Malaysia, whatever I learned in terms of research, um, that's entirely, I would say like around 85, 90% is in Malaysia. Not only because, you know, it's easier for me to talk to people, but also because there's more opportunity to learn things. Like every weekend, there are multiple workshops going on. I mean, a lot of you may know Professor Ramaya, right? Uh, multiple workshops. And in fact, when um, we started at IBS, 
at, um, and uh, Professor um, Dr. Farzana at that time, she joined in 2013. And I think her husband, Dr. Jihad, he was really good at smart PLS. And I know I remember that when they started, he did a, quite a few workshops for free at IBS. So there was so much opportunity to learn those things. And when I moved to America, I was just so surprised because either there are no opportunities to learn and wherever there's an opportunity to learn. So even now, if I go and attend a smart PLS workshop in America, it costs somewhere around 2000 to $2,500. And nobody have got that much money. I mean, compare this to 250 and 300 ringgit in Malaysia. Uh, <laughs> it's a big difference. So I, I really think that a lot of you who are in Malaysia um, have got a very good opportunity to develop yourselves as researchers and you know increase your toolbox of methods. Um, there are so many amazing people who are doing different type of trainings around. You know, so. And then again, um, you guys um, have Dr. Parzana here in the class. And I think, uh, honestly, the, I invited her for one video on my YouTube channel about literature review. And um, that's one of the most watched videos on my YouTube channel because people don't have a lot of guidance on writing literature review. And she explained things so amazingly that even till now, I get questions about that, like, you know, literature, this and that. Um, so, you know, just make sure that whatever opportunities you have, avail them. This is very, very important. Um, okay, and then um, uh, right now, I also work with uh, several journals uh, and several professional organizations related to research. So in hospitality and tourism, there are around um, 13 um, journals that are indexed in SSCI at this moment. And I'm involved with 10 of them. And uh, right now, the top three journals that are in hospitality, I'm involved with them as editor, editor for methodology or assistant editor or whatever. Now, it's very surprising. This is exactly what I was telling you in previous slide that um, in IBS, when I joined as a PhD student, there was only one course for research methods that I guess all of you also are taking, right? One course for research methods. Um, it's not a very detailed course. It's an introductory course. And honestly, other than that course, I've never taken in my whole life, never taken any other research methods course in a university. Um, but when I was in Malaysia, there were so many opportunities to learn. And right now, within five years, I'm acting as assistant editor for methodology for several top tier journals. So again, going back to the same thing that while you are there and you have an opportunity, especially now when everything is remote and people have a bit more time to do things, uh, make sure that you develop yourself as much as possible. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's that. And um, then, okay, what happened? All right. So, and then um, like um, Dr. Farzana said for YouTube, um, this is uh, something I have thought for a very long time to do um, in order to support uh, as many people as possible, because I feel social media is a common thing and people use it and consume it. Uh, I'm doing this YouTube channel all by myself for now. And I'm thankful to people like Dr. Farzana who are always ready to help and uh, able to come and talk on this channel about different methods. So I would recommend you checking it out. It's called Research Beast on YouTube. Um, I have many, many videos about different type of stuff, but this is mainly about research, right? So different type of methods like, um, you know, SEM or even qualitative methods, in vivo, this, that. Um, I've done a video, a couple of videos on Atlas or TI or fuzzy set qualitative analysis. In addition to this, I also interview editors from time to time, different editors of different journals to talk to them about what type of papers do they want to publish or, you know, questions that people have for those editors or whatever. In fact, this coming Monday, I was going to interview one editor um, and he was going to teach people how to review papers, you know, like as a student or as a young uh, member, when you get an invitation to review a paper, how do you review a paper? But I just got to know that um, he got coronavirus. So um, I, I hope and I pray that he gets well soon. Um, but, you know, these type of videos are happening on this channel. So make sure to uh, check it out. You know, it's um, it's for all of you just to develop yourself. All right. Now, uh, coming to my experience as research. So 
Again, it's uh, something very interesting. I, when I came to Malaysia, honestly, I um, came here for PhD. I mean, I knew I wanted to go for PhD, but I was not very sure about a lot of stuff, not no idea, nothing, right? So when I say my experience with research, actually my research experience really started at AHIBS. So when I start, I started my PhD uh, from the second day, uh, from the second day, I actually got into understanding research. And that's because my supervisor um, at that time, who now is at Taylor's University, Dr. Muslim Amin, maybe some of you know him, maybe not, I don't know. But um, he was my supervisor at that time. And then he was very you know, enthusiastic about research. So he got me into a lot of journals and this and that. So that's where my research experience really, really started with um, Azman Hashim International Business School. And then... Um, Maybe you guys know this group on Facebook called the Doctor Support Group, right? It's again uh, owned and um, created by one Malaysian lady called Anita Adnan. Um, it's one of the biggest support groups on uh, for researchers, right? So you can go and ask your questions and stuff like this. And I'm a very active member on this group. So answering people's questions about research, about research life, PhD, research papers, this and that, so a lot of stuff. Um, and again, the more you get on this group, the more you listen to people and their problems and their issues, the more you develop yourself as a researcher, right? So you see good things, bad things, things to do, things to avoid and stuff like this. And then while I was working, uh, I was studying at IBS, um, I had a friend who is a professor, a full professor from Pakistan, he um, at Taylor's University, Professor Kashir. So um, he um, told me that, um, I mean, I reached out to him and I told, asked him if I can work with him because I wanted to develop myself as a researcher more. And this is the time when I already was done with my proposal, but I got my proposal done in my second semester at IBS. So it was really my second year in PhD. So he asked me to come and work with him. So I worked with him as a volunteer. I was not getting paid or nothing, right? Because I wanted to, again, develop myself as a researcher to learn more, more and more about stuff. And he was working on several big Malaysian government projects at that time. One project was about business tourism in Malaysia. So um, it was a pretty big project and he was involved with uh, KLCC and Putrajaya Convention Center and several convention centers to see how business tourism is impacting. So that was one project we, I, I worked with him on. And then the other project we were working on was uh, uh, Port Dixon, development of Port Dixon as a, a resident destination. So bringing in residents instead of tourists to Port Dixon. And I think by now, Port Dixon would have developed uh, the river front and this and that uh, because I'm talking about 2013 2014 at that time they were trying to develop something I don't know how does it look like now but those projects working again enhanced my experience as a researcher right and then ultimately right now I'm supervising and working with students in Pakistan China Malaysia New Zealand obviously America and some other places and believe me the, the things that I listen to from students in the US are very similar to the things that I listen to from students in Malaysia. And those are all the same things from students coming up, especially if they have not done their work. So the, the excuses that come from students are very similar. It doesn't matter which culture, which country they are from. So again, the more you get into this, the more you learn from this, right? Now, I learned something from all of this in general, right? But I want to, before I tell you what I learned from all this, I want to ask um, all of you one question. Um, maybe somebody, if you want, you can unmute yourself and answer me. Um, is there anybody in this class who have got a dream organization, like an organization where you want to work? Like in the future, I definitely want to work in this place. Anyone? No? Okay, I don't know where the chat is. Maybe somebody is putting it. Well, chat. We have chat towards uh, down right side. Maybe you can figure it out. Yeah, or you can uh, you can do, you can put it in chat or you can just unmute yourself and say it. I mean, this is just easier to say it instead of chat. Yeah, please don't feel shy. You can share whatever you think. 
No. Nobody have got any dream organization to work with. <laughs> <That's sad. laughs> I guess we just want to get done with our PhD first. Yeah, but uh, I mean, yes. Um, so that's obviously that's the main intention for everybody, right? You need to finish your PhD. But, you know, normally, I mean, as um, students, you have to be like, you know, I mean, you don't have to have an organization like, you know, I want to work in the University of Malaya. Not like this. I mean, an ins you know, as an inspiration, as an aspiration or motivation, like I want to work here, I want to work there. I have several students um, who always tell me I want to work for United Nations World Travel Organization. It's a motivation. It's an inspiration. I mean, it's not necessary you end up working there, but just something like, like I want to work in this place or that place. Anyone? Dr. Faizan? Yes. Yeah, maybe I'm not dream of the, uh, I don't have any dream of the organization, but I have a dream to set up my own consultation, uh, consultant firm. Actually, okay, perfect. Yeah, because this is great. I'm doing some digitalization for the SME. So I feel like in future, I have a dream to set up a consultation firm to help the mm -hmm. SME in Malaysia okay. to get through the digitalization. Perfect. This is really good. So now let's say that um, one day you wake up and in your email, there's an email from Dr. Farzana and Dr. Farzana is telling you that, you know, uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow in HIBS, we have a brilliant panel and we have around five or six top consultants uh, and they are coming to talk about their experience of setting up things and how did they do it and whatever. Would you be willing to go and listen to them or not? Yes, definitely. All right, definitely. Yeah, right. So now just imagine you go to this um, talk and then all of these consultants or most of them start saying like, oh, my God, this is so bad. I don't know why am I doing this consulting. This this is just so ridiculous or something like this. Right. I mean, a lot of negative stuff and a lot of stuff. So what will happen to your own motivation? I mean, just imagine for a moment, like you would be like, what am I thinking for such a long time? Why am I doing it when these people who have already done it are not happy with it, right? I feel that um, with research, um, unfortunately, this is the situation. So, you know, um, maybe in some movies, you guys have seen that uh, there's something called support group, right? So maybe some people have a problem, maybe they are divorced or maybe some problem, whatever. But they go to a support group, everybody support each other, they listen to each other and they sort of like support each other, right? I will show you something um, for PhD um, support group. So there's a picture that I got from a PhD support group and that is this one. Um, so now if you look at this particular picture, it's very funny, right? And um, it is funny, like, you know, and maybe not this picture, there are so many other pictures or similar pictures, right, that you see on social media moving around here and there. And uh, that's okay, because I am a humorous guy. <laughs> I like, uh, I have a good sense of humor and I can laugh at a good joke. Um, or this is another picture that I took from another group that talk about um, something like this, right? Now, the problem with all this is it's good that, um, you know, it's joke or whatever. The problem is that, unfortunately, when people who are not in PhD yet, young researchers or people who aspire to go into research, right, what do they do? They normally go to people who have got their PhD or who are enrolled in PhD, or maybe they go on social media to some groups and see how it is, right? But then when you look at majority of posts like this or jokes like this, then what happens? In your head, you feel negative about it. Right. It, it is like this. I mean, honestly, in my country, and I'm sure in a lot of other countries, it's the same way. When the babies are born, sometimes parents say that I hope my kid become a doctor. I hope my kid become an engineer. Or I hope my kid become this or that. I hardly see anybody saying I hope my, my kid get a PhD. Nobody says this. Right. Why? Because there's a negativity around it. Right. And, and then, then there's another unfortunate thing with this, and that is in many countries, including Malaysia, including Pakistan, including Bangladesh, including many other countries, parents support their kids until the kids get a job. 
So by the time you finish your master's and then you tell your parents, I want to go for PhD, they're like, are you still want to study? Like you need to go and find a job or something, right? So these type of things create negativity um, around PhD. And ultimately what happens is that many young researchers, um, they think of something like this, like, oh my God, paper is difficult to publish, research is difficult to conduct and all this, right? Now, am I saying that this is all wrong and research is easy? I'm not saying that. I'm literally not saying that. It is difficult. But if you think about it, what is not difficult? I mean, really, what is not difficult? So uh, for now, um, I have two little kids. One is four-year-old, one is six-year-old. And um, if I ask them to read their book, which is alphabets, A, B, C, D, E, F, they can read it really quick. But if I give them a book from grade two, it's difficult for them. It's really difficult for them. They cannot read it. However, I can read it because I've gone through it. I've done enough practice to get it easy for me. Now, the problem is if, if when my kid is learning to read ABC and every minute or every day I tell him, no, no, it's very difficult. You cannot, oh, it's very difficult. You read it, you will have had it. No, 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 it's too difficult. It's permanent head damage. What will happen is ultimately my kid is going to lose hope. It's like, okay, I mean, if it's difficult, it's difficult. What should I do with it? So remember these things that, you know, anything is difficult. The easiest way you can deal with it is practice. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. Because of these type of things, people hate research. I know, unfortunately, so many people leave PhD, even in second year, even in third year, right? They leave PhD. Now, they, obviously, there are so many reasons for this, right? One reason is that people come into PhD for wrong reasons. And I'll talk about those reasons as well. However, I feel that if you are in a situation where you are stuck, Right? Where you're stuck, you don't know what's going on, or you feel like it's difficult or whatever. I think what you need to do is you need to understand what is research. And again, I want to quote my own example. So I <laughs> I came from UK to Malaysia. The first week or so, we were settling down, you know, home and this and that. Um, I, I was already married when I came. I mean, not married, engaged, but my wife was also a PhD student at IBS. And then we got married at the end of the first semester. So we both came um, to Malaysia and we were settling down the first week. Then, you know, the the, the, the next Monday when the, the university started, I remember I was not even having a student card or whatever yet, right, because just started. But I went to meet Dr. Muslim uh, and uh, he asked me, what do you want to work on? I told him that uh, I want to work on service quality and satisfaction because that's what I did in master's. Then he told me, how are you going to work on it? There's like a lot of work already done on it. It's like already 30 years there's research on this and there's hardly you can do anything on it. So I was completely quiet because I don't, I really didn't know what to say because all this time from my master's to PhD, I was thinking I'm going to do the same thing in my PhD. Now my supervisor is telling me that you cannot do it. And I don't know research. Like I said earlier, I have no clue about research, right? So he told me that um, just go and um, see what else can you come up with, right? So I go back uh, to my apartment and just like anybody else, I have no clue what to do. So what do I do? I go to Google. I even do not go to Google Scholar. I go to Google, right? <laughs> I go to Google. I just write some stuff, got a couple of things. I come back to my supervisor after three, four days. And um, I told him, I even don't remember what did I tell him at that time. But he was, I, all I remember is he was angry. I, I don't know what I told him. I forgot. <laughs> I remember he was very angry. Like, this is what you come up with after all this time, right? So I told him, like, okay, then what do I do? This is the first time that I got to understand the difference between journals. This is like PhD already, second week, the first time when I told my supervisor I don't know what to do. This is the first time when I got to know what is the difference between Web of Science, Scopus, SSCI, and this and that. This is the first time I got to know that not every journal charges to publish. No clue. I had no clue. Like I said, just like a lot of other students, right? So 
my supervisor and, and I still to this day I have that notebook. In fact, a few days ago I shared the pictures on uh, Facebook from my notebook that I had at that time. I still hold it. Um, he told me a few journals. He asked me go to read Journal of Business Research, Journal of Academy of Marketing Science, Journal of Marketing Management, right? Um, and then I said okay. So he he asked me just go and read them, right? So again, just like a typical student. I go to read them, but how much do I read? Maybe four papers or five papers. And there's a reason for it. The reason is that when I download the paper, I start reading it, I have no clue what the paper is talking about. Like there's no, I, I cannot understand the paper. <laughs> no idea what is this paper talking about, especially no research methods, nothing. So introduction still, I can understand a little bit. Literature re review, no idea what's going on. Methodology, completely no idea what's going on. And then, so I read four, five, six papers. I take some notes. I come back to Dr. Muslim. And then I remember he was very angry. Uh, he told me that if you want to um, succeed, you need to do something. You need to start doing three things and you need to stop doing three things. So at that time, I was thinking that, okay, because I just came to Malaysia anyway, I'm not doing a lot of things. <laughs> I just came. I don't know anybody. I have no friends, no nothing. Like, I even don't have a bank account yet. So maybe I'll ask him to tell me what should I stop doing because that must be easier. Like I anyway, I have nothing to do. So I asked him what should I stop doing? And he told me you should stop going out, stop meeting your friends and stop enjoying your life. Okay, that was too much for me to take, right? <laughs> Everything needs to be stopped. And then he told me that what you need to start doing the three things is read, read, and read. And um, that's actually the thing uh, that changed my, uh, my, my perspective on being a PhD student and really changed the, 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 the way for me as a student, as a PhD student. And I really took his advice to heart. I, and I remember when he told me read, 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 right at that time, he also in his office taught me how to make the, um, the literature map, um, you know, like a tab tabular format and take out information from each paper. So I went back and within a week, I read around 35, 40 papers. And it was really, really uh, a torture. It was honestly a torture. I mean, I couldn't understand. I pushed myself to read it. And that day I got to understand that, um, you know, research is really, if you want to do good research, it creates confusion. It creates headache, right? When you don't know what are you doing. And I think that's the beauty of it when you are lost in it. If you are not, then it means you're not doing enough. And uh, when after this, I come back to Dr. Muslim, I told him that I have severe headache. Um, and he told me that's okay. Like the day your PhD finish, your headache will finish. It didn't. I mean, till now it didn't. It's just like that. But uh, but it's beautiful. It's good, right? So um, I, I just want to tell you one thing that right at that time, if I did not ask Dr. Muslim for help, uh, most probably I would have left my PhD. I mean, you know, because there's a limit to things, right? When you cannot understand it. And that is why it's important to understand that when you are stuck, instead of making wrong decisions, instead of making bad decisions, you should ask for help. This is just so important to ask for help. Um, and this help can come from several sources. It's not maybe only your supervisor. It can be from several sources, right? I just shared with you my YouTube channel. Now, I don't know how, but this the way it works is this. So if somebody is really good at research, like your professors, many students want to work with that professor. And then ultimately what happens is that professor ends up having 10, 15, 12, 13 students. And humanly, it's not possible to give quality supervision to that many students. It's difficult, right? So in that type of situation, students need to take initiative. Like students need to reach out to supervisors and say, like, can we set up a time? Can we meet? Can we talk? And we are human beings, right? We are, we are just human beings. And from marketing perspective, honestly, right now, human beings, can anybody guess what's our attention span, right? Eight seconds. Eight seconds, you will forget things, right? That's how we are. So as a person, I understand that my attention span is little. I forget things, but I do not apply the same to my supervisor. 
like I I know that I can forget things, but when it comes to my supervisor, I blame my supervisor. Oh, my supervisor didn't do this. My supervisor didn't. It's it's just not possible, right? So I think as a student, it's completely fine to reach out to a supervisor. Now I'm not saying that all supervisors are good. It's it's not possible, right? People are different. So in the situation where your supervisor is not very helpful or you cannot find your supervisor, whatever, then one idea is to maybe change your supervisor. If you cannot do that, then maybe find another way to equip yourself. Because in the end, when you graduate and you leave, you take your own dissertation in your hand and that has your name on it. It's not your supervisor's name on that dissertation, right? So make sure that you understand this. And then when I say um, help, it's also important to know what help do you need to, um, uh, what type of help do you want and how do you ask for it? You know, um, I um, honestly, you know, uh, I'm not saying something very big here, but I am very busy, like very busy schedule. And sometimes people reach out to me and say, can I talk to you for five minutes? Okay. And normally I prefer to talk with chat, like on Facebook or something, because I can do other things and also, you know, like it's multitasking. But many students say, oh, can I talk to you on WhatsApp? Or can I, you know, so, okay, I mean, it's okay, right? So I don't mind it. And I say it's okay. And then it's just so disappointing that many times students ask questions that are just no questions. Like I, so many times I get a question, uh, doctor, can you give me a topic? What type of a question is that? Or what type of a help is that? I mean, if I had a topic, why I shouldn't do it by myself? Right? First of all, like this is the logical answer, right? Second, I don't know what are you studying. I don't know what is your supervisor talking to you. I don't know what have you covered so far. What have you read so far? How can I give you a topic? Right? Rather than this, same question, just same question, just in another way. How can you ask? You can do some research, come up with three or four topics, and then you call me and ask me, like, Doctor, I come up with these four question topics. Which one do you think is a good topic? It's much easier for me to answer and guide you and probably give you some more hints, right? But just asking something, just yesterday, yesterday I saw one guy, and this is, again, it goes beyond student teacher. It goes beyond so many things. Because the way we talk, the way we say things, it portrays not only you as a student, it also portrays your culture, it portrays your nationality, it portrays your religion. It's so much more than this. I, I, I will find a screenshot and I'll send it to all of you. Just yesterday, I saw on one group, it's called Tourism Research Network. It has all the tourism uh, researchers. And uh, one guy, I don't know which country, um, but a Muslim guy, um, uh, Abdul Rahman, his name was. So he asked a question and he said that uh, um, my topic is about travel agents. Uh, can somebody send me research papers on travel agent? I mean, you know, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. And then in tourism, the number one researcher, Michael Hall, okay, number one researcher in tourism. This guy has more than 100,000 citations, number one. He commented on this guy's uh, post and he told him that, you know, it's difficult to judge what do you want. Maybe if you can search on Google and then come up with some ideas, then people can help you. Just what I said. And would you believe this guy respond to him and said, not everything is on Google. If you cannot help, you should just shut up. This student answer just like this without knowing that this guy is a top professor. And what this guy answer to him is like, I don't know why you are so panic. And, uh, you know, this is just the right floor or something. And then in the end, he also said that judging by your name, I would highly recommend you to read this book. And the name of the book is Hospitality and Islam, which basically talks about how to be nice. So, you know, I mean, again, think about this as a student, when you go and, you know, I will tell you something. You guys won't believe this one. And this is again my story. 2013, I was I just finished my second semester. 
and God bless Dr. Muslim, uh, I had no money at that time. There was a conference in Thailand and I really had no money. Dr. Muslim asked me to present my proposal in this conference in Thailand. I really had no money. So he paid my air ticket and hotel room rent and the conference waived my conference fee, right? So I go to this conference and in the conference, I met one professor from America. His name is Professor Jihan, okay? I met him, we talked a little bit. Do you know, he is my colleague right now. And that guy interviewed me, Professor Jehan, for my job in US. But the time when I met him in Thailand, I had zero clue that I'll be working with him in the future. Zero clue, okay? And I just want to show you quick. Um, because this is useful for you what I'm telling you because these are experiences and it's going to help you a little bit in your own uh, so let me show you guys something very interesting um, in a conference in Taiwan and he was speaking in a conference in Taiwan okay so I just want to show you this. Let me stop sharing my screen. I don't know how to share it. I think we can see now Prof. Chihan's face, right? Oh. Uh, it disappeared again, Dr. Yes. Faisan. It disappeared again. Okay, yes, yes, I know. It. Yeah, I actually, why. I like to use Zoom, but many we have students here from China, and some they, they are not allowed to use Zoom, so we have to use Webex. I just want to. Every day. Right? Um, if you can see it, uh, this message uh, I took a screenshot was sent to me by somebody else, just somebody else. Somebody else sent me this screenshot and said that this my screenshot of. He mentioned his interaction from you when you were a PhD student. He had your work and appreciated your ability to be a self-learned person. I'm sharing that you might want to know. Your work is acknowledged. Now, why am I sharing this with you? There's a big reason for this. Um, and that is uh, when you as a PhD student do things, many times you forget it because you are a student, so many things happening. People remember, right? People remember. So. 2013, now is to 2020, uh, Professor Jinhan remembers this thing for seven years. And actually, I know this, that he speaks about this in several places, not like, and then, you know, some other people who know you can, so this screenshot was sent to me by somebody else saying that Dr. Jinhan is talking about you, about something that happened um, seven years ago. So please make sure that, you know, when you interact with people, when you talk to people, when you help, um, that you do your best, um, you are at your best behavior. Because, like I said, and these days, um, uh, you know, again, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality, right? When you do something, people don't look at you as you, but they associate a lot of your demographics with you, right? What's your nationality? What's your gender? Where do you come from? Your really all those things. So make sure that, you know, when you ask for help, you are able to understand what help do you need and how are you asking? It's very, very important. All right. Now, let's come to the... <laughs> $100,000 question, what is research? 
Uh, we all do a lot of research, right? All of us are indulged in research and, you know, all this stuff. But the thing is, we all do not know what is research because research is such a big thing. And for everybody, it is different, right? So um, you will see that a lot of people right now uh, in coronavirus, you have a bunch of people who are wearing white coats and they are trying to find a vaccine for coronavirus. There are a lot of other people who are looking at the psychological impact of coronavirus and a lot of other things, right? So research in itself becomes so big. For some people, it's applied research where you try to find a problem, a, a solution to a problem. For some people, it's more of a uh, investigative um, sort of thing where you are trying to do theoretical research and things like this. Now, one thing that I really like uh, is that research is formalized curiosity. I mean, if you are not curious, if you don't look around you, if you don't question things, um, you cannot be a good researcher. Now, the most funny story about one of the best researchers is Newton. So I think all of you, um, it doesn't matter which country you come from or where did you study, you know the story about Newton, right? Which is actually a fake story, but there's a story that there was an apple that hit his head and he came up with the law of gravity, right? And uh, the way people explain it is that the apple hit his head uh, and then he thought, why did the apple hit my head? Why did it not go up? I mean, you know, the, the it's actually a fake story because when people talk about this story, at that time, Newton was already in his uh, 20s. Um, I, I always think, like, did he never put water from a bottle in a glass or something, like where the water goes from up to down or something? I mean, you know, apple was not necessary to hit his head. But regardless, the whole point is that he was curious. Something happened, he was curious, he questioned it, and then that's how things are. So to be able to uh, become a good researcher, um, it's important that you are curious, but it's not all. Like, if you are curious, that's not all, right? I mean, right now, um, my kids are just so curious, very curious. Like, they every day ask me so many questions. Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? Right? Um, just a bit earlier, I was showing them one um, a small cartoon about um, <laughs> about Surah Ikhlas. It's a cartoon in which they try to explain the, the whole idea of um, uh, Surah Ikhlas with some characters talking to each other. And uh, oh my God, I, the, the, the cartoon is four and a half minutes, but it took me 40 something minutes to finish it because every word there was a Y and Y and O and how, right? Now, the thing is when it, it is not only the curiosity, it's also about poking and prying, which means that once you are curious about something, then you need to change it around, see from different perspectives how things are, what does it mean and stuff like that. Just so, so important, right? A funny thing about research is that uh, when we look at research, people have different type of perceptions about it. My father, I tell him I do research. And now, you know, Dr. Farzana is lucky in that situation because her father was a professor. Uh, my father worked in a bank. Uh, he has no clue about research papers and impact factor and things like this, right? So he doesn't understand. He thinks like, you know, I am just, you know, like this person doing a lot of stuff with statistics and technology and things like this. My cousins and friends who also do not know a lot about it, they feel I'm just having fun at conferences, eating free donuts and drinking free coffee and stuff like this. Um, but actually what I do, and I like this picture in then, is thinking, right? Most of us keep thinking all the time, what's going to happen? Where will this paper, when will this paper get accepted? How about the revision? Who are my co-authors? How to submit? When to submit? How to learn this? And it's just an endless cycle uh, that we are going through, right? But it's just that um, researchers have a lot of caps to wear. Now, because of this, uh, uh, people sometimes lose sight of what originally is research. And this definition, I think if you all, um, you know, um, memorize this definition, it will help you all, uh, with a lot of stuff. So I feel that uh, uh, one thing is that research is a process. It's not a one-off thing. It's not like start and end. It's not like that. Um, it's a process. And when I say a process, remember that when you finish your research, um, it's a starting point for another research. Um, so it's a, it's a cycle, right? So you finish and then 
And the reason for that is because no research in this world, it doesn't matter what research you're talking about, no research in this world is a perfect research. And there's always loopholes, there's always limitations, there are always things that you want to do but you cannot do um, because of cost, because of time and other issues, right? So it's a process. Um, and then if you look at this um, other words, which is seek or revise, seek is things that you don't know, right? So if there's a question like coronavirus right now, nobody knows where is the vaccine. So people are trying to seek the answer to it, which means it's new. They're trying to seek. Um, revise is something that you know, but you know that there might be limitations to it. So you try to revise it, right? Um, so here, um, uh, you know, a lot of people have uh, a question about their PhD, and that is, what should I do in my PhD? So your supervisors normally tell you that in your PhD, you should do something new uh, that nobody has done before, right? And then I don't know how many of you this, but I'm sure that a lot of you have this question. If I do something completely new, where will the literature come from? I mean, if it's all new, how would I know it's doing right or what? And then the funny thing is when you write something, then your supervisor asks you, where is the reference? Then you say, oh, but you asked me to do something new. If I do new, where is the reference to it, right? So to, to that answer, and these two words are very important, seek or revise. Um, so remember that when you do PhD, or uh, uh, this PhD should be within uh, a boundary of one discipline. So let's say if you are working on SME development, like earlier somebody said that I want to be a consultant for SME development. So if you want to do SME development, you have to do your research within SME development context. So you have to have some sort of an idea of what people are talking about. So even if you are doing something new, how would you know that this is new unless you don't know what has been done before? Right. So you have to understand what has been done before. And then once you know this is done, then you can decide whether you want to create something new or what. Now, remember this. Uh, right now, maybe some of you want to buy iPhone 12 because that's a new iPhone that came out. Right. So iPhone 12 is the revised version of iPhone 11. Yes. But iPhone 12 couldn't be a revised version until Apple did not know what's wrong with iPhone 11. So whatever was wrong with iPhone 11 or whatever was outdated, they updated or fixed it in iPhone 12. So whenever you revise something, that also becomes something new. It's like the old thing, right? Now the problem arises when you replicate something, it means that there is a model already done and you want to do this model maybe in another country. Right? So somebody did a research in America, you want to do it in Malaysia. The question is, many people will ask you, okay, so what new are you doing here? What's new here? Right? What is it that you are doing here? I think there's a lot of new things and that is, but you know, what is the difference between Malaysian people and American people? What do they focus on? Right? That's, that's the new thing. And sometimes what will happen is that there's so much new stuff that you have to revise the model. You might have to add new things to it because it does not explain everything, right? It just doesn't. So, for instance, um, in America, there's a lot of places that are considered as historic buildings, okay? But when you go to these historic buildings, the date on that building is 1935, 1930, 1925. And then you go to Egypt, and then you see historic buildings, 10,000 year old. 8,000 year old, you go to China, 5,000 year old, 6,000 year old, right? So there's a difference between historic, the date as well, right? So maybe there was a theory developed in America about, uh, you know, let's say heritage tourism, where they look at the time and whatever. And then you want to apply that theory in Egypt or China, but because the concept, the context is so different that you may have to revise the theory. That happens with many cases. Do you guys know surf call? Service quality, surf call, the five dimensions, right? Surf call was presented in 1985, really 1988 when people started using it about service quality. But then in uh, 1994, after the internet came, uh, many companies started having websites and stuff like this. Um, surf call was just not the right thing to use for website service quality. And then the same authors who proposed surf call 
in 2002 or 2000, they proposed e surf call. So they revised their own model, which was surf call, to come up with a new one called e surf call, which is a contribution. So that's why it's important for you to understand that it's not always new, really, in terms of new, right? What we say new and as new, but also revising things is becoming something new as well. But when you revise something to you, you need to explain it to prove. Now, okay, so let me ask all of you this, okay, please answer me. Why do you do research? So all of you are applying, I mean, you are in PhD program and you are doing research right now. Why do you want to do research? What is the thing? I mean, I know that many people answer me, say that I want to do research to find the answers. This is, I hear a lot, like I want to do research to find the answers, but what else? No? Okay. Um, so I am um, yeah. no qualitative. Yes, 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 no. Uh, well, uh, professor, I want to do research to become an expert learner. <laughs> Uh, sorry, you want to do research to do what? To become an expert learner. Okay, makes sense. This is very good. Now, uh, I am no qualitative researcher, okay? I'm not lo like Dr. Rosmini, no no qualitative research, but um, I can do a little bit. Right? So over the last three, four years, I've asked this question maybe around three, four thousand people. And all the answers I get, I put them into a content analysis. So I have like a few bullet points that people answer me. Um, one is to get your degree and diploma, right? So in many universities, you have to write a research paper to be able to graduate, right? So maybe a scopus or something. And that's why many people just submit it to a third level journal just so that they can get acceptance and the degree is <laughs> done and all is good, right? The other reason is because of your parents and friends and teachers and stuff like this, right? So parents, maybe a lot of people get into PhD because their parents want them to get a PhD and, and all that. Some people do it as a peer pressure. You know, peer pressure is where you see your friends are publishing, so you also want to do it. Otherwise, it and, and these days, I do it all the time to make people feel bad. No, no, I'm kidding. I, I share on Facebook. Every time I publish something, I share on Facebook. Um, and then I see many people want to publish as well, right? So that's a good thing, peer pressure, right? And then um, uh, to many people, it's like a small success. So, you know, many people are highly motivated. So they want to do research because every time they do some small piece of research, um, they feel successful, they feel motivated. Some people do it as um, their sense of achievement or their fulfillment or curiosity, like no who said, I want to be a learner, I want to learn something, right? Stuff like this. Uh, some people do it as an ambition, that that's their ambition. Now, if you really put them together, you will see that uh, a few of these things are external motivation and a few of these things are internal motivation. People who are really, really successful at research around you, you check it out. They are people who do it because of internal motivation. If people do it for external motivation, then they may be successful, but not as much as people who really do it from internal motivation. And you can listen to as many people as you want on YouTube, TED Talk, this, that, and you will see that many people who are really successful, it's because they do it for internal motivation. And um, um, that's what I have learned over the years as well. Right? So I think it's good to do it because your friends are doing it all. But, you know, you will really enjoy research the moment you do it because you want to learn about something or because you want to expect something. I, I will give you, a, I, again, I, I hope God forgives me for saying this. I'm not saying this as a show off or something, but honestly, um, in the college where I work, uh, I got my job in 2016 and um, by now, I have, in, uh, I'm talking about only what I have done since I got this job at USF. Um, I've published around 42 papers in the last four years. Um, and normally uh, the requirement at USF is two papers a year. So I was supposed to publish um, eight papers because I'm 
four years already at this place. I've published 42 papers and some people ask me, why do you do that? Honestly, I do it because I want to compete with my own self. I want to be better than myself compared to last year. I want to be better. Now, better is not always in terms of number. Okay, so honestly, in 2018, I published 11 papers. In last year, I published nine papers, which actually is less than 11. But last year, the journals that I selected were much better than in 2018. And then this year, I've published seven papers, but this year I published in mainstream business journals and not hospitality journals, much higher impact, right? So, you know, you try to do it as your own self expected. I do it. I mean, I compete with my own self, right? How good is that, right? Instead of feeling jealous of any other person or instead of feeling bad about other people, compete with your own self. Like you want to be better than yesterday. You want to be better than last year. So it's good. Nobody is going to blame you for anything. And in fact, um, in this world or even um, based on your religion, you any religion, I'm not talking only about Muslims, even people who follow Buddhism or, you know, other religions, it's the same thing. You cannot feel bad about other people, right? And um, there's, a, there's an Indian movie called Three Idiots. I don't know how many of you watched that, but there's a very interesting dialogue in that movie that it... It's very painful when you get a low score, right? Um, it's very painful when you get a low score, but it's even more painful if your friend gets more score than you. So uh, that's very true, right? That happens to a lot of us. So make sure that you, you know, compete with your own self and that, that's a better approach. Uh, a good friend of mine, Professor Febzi, he, um, he shared this with me and this is a published paper and I really, really like it. So what they did was they analyzed a lot of research that was published and then they analyzed the authors, right? The people and the type of papers and everything. Um, and according to them, there are four types of uh, researchers, okay? So one is uh, storytellers. Okay, storytellers are people who are not good at research, but they are good at talking. And then they create a whole thing around themselves where everybody thinks they're good researchers, but they are not. Okay, so the type of research that they publish is just not good, but you know, people think they're good researchers. The other type is copycats. These are people who just copy good papers, you know, other, other research and replication. And the third one is profilers. These are people who focus more on um, not the phenomena, but the people, you know, like, um, many consumer behavior researchers or organizational behavior researchers, they don't look at the concept of, for example, perceived value or service quality, not the concepts, but they look at people, how many people feel this way, how many people feel that way. And many of these people become consultants. Um, when you are a consultant, or, you know, or industry people, then they become profilers. And then the last one is innovators. These are the people who really create cutting edge research or new theories or something like this, right? Obviously, uh, there are very few innovators, very few, right? There are not too many people who um, are producing really high level research. Or, um, to be honest, if you want to succeed, I think um, copycat is a good formula to work with. Now, when I say copycat, you need to make sure that when if you are copying, right? Don't copy storytellers and profilers, copy innovators. So follow the people who have been successful and who have been successful so that you can. And um, again, I apologize, but I just want to quote something from, um, from my religion. Again, one very quick thing. And that is for Muslims, when we pray five times, um, in the prayers, every time you pray, you say this, you pray to God that show me the way of people who have succeeded and not the people who have, you know, so we say this, right? In our prayers, we say it. So even from that perspective, make sure you follow the people who have done good, who have done good. So even when you follow, um, your research can be better instead of, you know, the other two um, groups. So this is uh, that. And uh, yeah, this is um, the sad reality of academia. Uh, when I came to Malaysia, right in the start, I heard this uh, this phrase a lot, which was publish or perish. Um, many, I mean, till now people say it. But um, then in the last few years, it changed to publish in high impact journals or perish. So 
uh, you know, people don't consider. In fact, I uh, know that in many places now when you apply for jobs or scholarships, they only ask you to, um, you know, mention the papers in your CV, the ones that have impact factor or something. So they don't consider everything else. It's something like that. I go to China as a visiting professor in several universities. And um, I not now, but in the start when I was applying, um, they would remove everything from my CV. The only papers that remained on my CV were the ones with uh, impact factor more than three. So, you know, it, it is just like that. And then now it's even more difficult because there's so much more competition. Now. There are so many more people who are doing good research. And now it become published frequently in high impact journals and maybe you won't perish. So, you know, and the reason for this is because people understand this part, uh, publish frequently in high impact journals. People understand this and they try to do it. But how they try to do it is wrong. Um, you may have seen many, many people uh, who publish everything. I don't understand sometimes, but it's just like that. They publish marketing, publish finance, publish this, publish that, publish this, publish that. It's just not gonna cut it. If you go and apply for a job, these days many jobs are even coming very specific. Like when you apply for a job, many jobs are we want a professor in uh, experience management. We want a professor in entertainment management. We want a professor in supply chain management. Very, very specific jobs. So now when you go there and you say, I want to teach this, but your research is all over the place, and it's just not going to make any sense. So make sure that when you publish frequently, still keep your niche, keep one area. Now, for professors, sometimes it's a bit difficult, right? A little bit difficult. So if I have students and some students are working in one area, some students are working in another area, another area, then of course some professors. But for all of you young researchers, you don't have that problem. So when you publish, make sure that you're publishing in your own area, that one niche, so that when you apply for jobs, people understand what is your research area, okay? Um, all right, Dr. Farzana, how much time do we have? Uh, Dr. Farzana, the floor is yours. You can speak even another one hour. It's up to <laughs> your comfort zone because you have that night, I think. You're so kind yes. that you are still awake for us. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's, it's my pleasure. I'll just um, share a few more experiences and then maybe another 15, 20 minutes and then we can um, stop. Completely okay? up to you. It's Thank okay. you. So the question is when you decide that you want to publish, you want to publish in high impact factor journals and your niche, where do you start? That's the issue, right? Where do you start? So to many of you where you cannot understand what should be your topic, what should be your topic, what should be your topic? then it's important to know how do you go with the flow. So remember that a good research is always about a good research topic. You cannot do a good research if your topic, like the, the topic that you want to work on is not good. If your topic is not good, your research is ultimately not good. So your good research needs to start with a good research topic. How do you come up with a good topic? Once you have a good understanding of literature. Why do I say this? Because when you understand the literature, like from the top, when you look at the literature and you understand the literature, then you realize, okay, these are the things that are done. And then there are some stuff that may not be done right now. Or maybe these are the things that are done, but they are very old. Or maybe these are the things that are done, but they have a problem. Right? Something like this. So a good research topic always comes when you have a good knowledge of literature. And remember, Good knowledge of literature does not come after reading 10 papers or 15 papers. It's it's not like that. You have to understand one thing. Right now, I cannot claim this, but uh, when I was studying for my PhD, uh, not first year though, second year and third year, um, uh, there was a time in the second year or start of third year when um, I used to go and listen to other students in colloquium in IBS and also when I was at Taylor's University there also in conferences and stuff where I could tell people name of the author, name of the paper and stuff and ask them to read that. I mean, just looking at what they're presenting. 
because of having that grasp on the literature. So make sure you know it. And good knowledge means that you should read as much as you can where there's a time when you start looking saturation, where you start looking the same ideas repeating again and again in your area. That's where you understand that you've read enough of literature about stuff, right? So when you have, um, yeah, so a lot of reading will give you a good knowledge of literature. Now, this literature is good for a topic like, okay, I want to study maybe artificial intelligence, or I want to study maybe the use of robots and businesses. We are talking about abstract topic, right? Now, digging down deep and really understanding what should be the really practical topic, the research question, what should I do with that? That is challenging. And the reason why it's challenging is because I gave you my example earlier about how Dr. Muslim asked me to go and read research papers, right? And I'm sure that most of you are doing the same thing, right? We go meet your supervisor or email your supervisor as you read research papers. I, with a lot of respect, I disagree to this. And I think it's not a good approach. A literature review from research papers is only good to understand the abstract topic and to write your literature review. But if you want to understand your research question, that cannot come from a research paper. Uh, and the reason for that is because research papers are outdated. They are very outdated. Um, even if you go now, I mean, normally people don't do this. Normally people use three, four year old papers. But even if you go now, and even if you download a paper that is published today, like both, there are many journals where they have early site, right? Early site, when as soon as the paper is accepted within a week or so, it goes up. Go and check it. Even if a paper is published today, like today, go and check. That paper is at least one and a half, two years old. Why? Because when whoever worked on that paper, they wrote it, collect data, analyze data, then the paper went through review and blah, blah, blah. So it's, at, you know, even if it's not one and a half, at least one year old. Now, many people think one year is not a lot of time. I mean, one year is it's not too much, but think about it. Think about your life last year at this time. And think about your life now. In one year, the entire world has changed. Okay? I mean, one year puts a lot of a lot of change. And then in one year, there may be a lot of things that what you want to study is already studied. I give you an example. Okay, so uh, do you guys know Google Glass? Right, Google Glass was a I glass from Google that was uh, augmented reality. So you can see Google Map and blah blah blah. For the last five years, for the last five years, every year Google say that this is the next big thing, but it doesn't go because people don't apply. It. So if you go to a research paper, many times you are going to pick up something that either is already obsolete, already gone. Okay, another example I will give you. A few days ago, I was looking on a social media. Maybe some of you remember this. Uh, do you guys remember a floppy disk? Like it was a white disk, floppy disk, very small. People put one or two documents in it in the night, like maybe 2002, 2003, around that time, right? Floppy disk. Um, then USB came. No, after floppy disk, CD came, CD. So CD, people used to carry CD and put Word documents and things on CD. And then uh, USB came, right? And then USB is the now. The now people are using USB. CD finished very quickly for data storage, right? for document storage and whatever. Now think about uh, audio video recording. So there was a time where people had uh, VCR. So there were video cassettes, like the big black cassettes with a tape. Right? You guys may remember it. And after that, we had MP3 CDs, then MP4, then DVD, then Blu-ray, right? Now, Blu-ray finished very quickly, very quickly. I guess within a year or so it finished. And the reason why it finished was because all of a sudden people got cable networks and this and that and Wi-Fi and all this. So DVD didn't really go through. Now, just imagine, put yourself at that time when DVD just came out and now you want to do a research on DVD. By the time your research is published, DVD is no more in the market or Blu-ray is no more in the market. 
right? So things change quickly. And if you pick up a topic that is already two years, one year old, then when you end up, I mean, your PhD is going to take, what, two to three years. By the time you finish your PhD, maybe nobody is even interested in what you are working on. That is why it's not a good idea to pick up your research question from research papers. Not a good idea. Rather, what you should do is this, okay? Look at sources of literature. Do you guys know APA? APA style of referencing, right? APA. Now, if you go to APA style of referencing, the manual on how to do the referencing, do they only show research papers or do they show how to cite books, how to cite uh, conference papers, how to cite blogs, how to cite websites, how to cite Wikipedia, how to cite YouTube videos, how to cite podcasts? It show all this, right? Why? Because you as researcher are supposed to read and cite those things. If you are not supposed to cite it, why are they showing you how to cite it? You as researcher, you are supposed to read those things, get some information from there and use it and then refer to it. So very important. And unfortunately, any schools, like I'm not talking about only Malaysian universities, any universities. I, I, I mean, when I go to Pakistan, I go to um, China, nobody says this. Everybody focus on research papers. Okay? So, and then ultimately, there's another big criticism, and maybe many of you don't know this, but maybe Dr. Farzana knows this. Many of us have this big criticism that who reads your research papers? Who reads your research? You publish a paper, who reads it? Only PhD students. There's a reason, because we ask PhD students only to read research papers. <laughs> so that's why nobody else reads. And plus, the way we find our topics, by the time they are published, they are outdated. Industry doesn't want it. I mean, it's already too old. Nobody wants it, right? So very important, when you want to really come up with your research question, the practical research question, in, in addition to journal articles, read industry magazines. Industry magazines talk about things happening now, okay? Industry shows. I will give you a couple of examples from this as well. Social media, blogs, podcasts, and your own experiences. So let me give you one example very quickly from um, industry shows and also from, um, in, yeah, industry shows. So right now, COVID-19 is a big problem. I mean, you know, when I talk to people, even if my talk has nothing to do with COVID-19, it somehow comes to COVID-19 because somebody asked me a question about COVID-19, right? So because everybody's life is so disruptive with it. I was doing a special issue on COVID-19, okay? So I was editing a special issue for COVID-19 and uh, it was for a journal that is edited by my friend, but it's a new journal by Emily, just I guess three years old or four year old, right? So that journal is not even indexed in Scopus, not indexed in SSCR or whatever. It's, it's published by Emerald, but it's just so new that it's not indexed anywhere. So my friend, she told me that because I have many connections, so if I say that I'm editing, they may get more people submit into this issue. What happened? So we what call for paper, we got 600 submissions, 600. And the topic of uh, that uh, special issue was impact of COVID-19 on hospitality, okay? Because it's a hospitality journal, like hotels and restaurants and this and that. Now, 600 abstracts is a lot for a journal that is not in Scopus, not in anywhere, right? But do you know what are the topics? Now, the topics in special issue are supposed to be a topics that are cutting edge, that are talking about future, that are talking about things that nobody knows. The topic is the impact of COVID-19 on hotel. Okay, this is not even a topic. Okay, the impact of COVID-19 on people's stress. Do we not know that people are already stressed with COVID-19? Why do I have to read a research paper to know people are stressed? Right? The impact of COVID-19 on job losses. And I mean, it just doesn't make sense. What is industry talking about? Industry is talking about, uh, not talking, industry is doing it. Industry has ultraviolet robots in the hotels cleaning the rooms. Industry has thermal scanners 
checking people. Industry has flexi glasses to avoid personal. Industry is already way ahead. Like already they're doing things after understanding. And our academic researchers, they are just talking about something that we already know. So for all of you, when you want to pick up your topic, it's so important to read industry magazines. Any magazine you pick up in your area, right? Mine is hospitality. I know there are five or six industry magazines free on online available. If you are in hotel industry, if you work in hotel, then your research is about um, uh, the industry magazine that you need to look at is um, a lodging magazine or hotel news now or hospitality upgrade, right? These are top magazines. When you go there and you see things, you'll be surprised what hotels are doing already. Do you guys know that McDonald's have already launched a complete restaurant of the future because of it's launched, it's working. People are going and ordering this completely contactless, completely because of COVID. Industry is doing this and our academic researchers are saying for special to the impact of COVID-19 on job loss. It doesn't make sense. Nobody is interested, right? So industry magazine. The other one is industry show. So industry show uh, and Malaysia is really good. I mean, not now because of COVID, but really Malaysia is one of the top destinations for business tourism where there's a lot of these shows happening, right? Um, industry trade shows and stuff where people bring their products and stuff. Um, last year, I went to one industry show and there was a company, this company created um, earphones, you know, like um, Apple, uh, Apple's AirPods, very small, right, wireless. And uh, there was a really interesting thing about those earphones. They had ultrasonic rays, so you cannot hear anything, but it just puts some rays into your uh, ears which stimulates some part of your brain that can make you relax. And they are targeting this to those very high tension jobs like chef. If you are a chef in a big hotel where you are managing a lot of stuff and it's hot and it's noisy and it's you know smoke and everything, you get stressed. So if you put those in your ears for 10 minutes, it can relax your brain. So you become completely like if you had eight hours of sleep and you're fresh, right? This thing, nobody knows about it because it came in a show. It's like a prototype. Nobody knows. And you know what those people were looking for? Those people were looking for somebody who can work with them on research about this, like how people are reacting to it. I'm working with them now. But this tool, nobody, it's not even available. I just got to know it through industry shows. I have a very good friend. Her name is Ulrike Gretzel. She is um, in California. This lady, she's one of the top researchers working on social media, okay? How did she become top scholar? I'll tell you. 15 years ago, she go to an industry show. Her research at that time was social media and because her PhD was in education. So she met a bunch of guys, young guys, American guys, and uh, they talk. And she told them, like, this is my research. And they told her, that, oh, this is good. I mean, we can work together. You know who are those guys? Those guys at that time, those are the owners of TripAdvisor. At that time, they even didn't launch TripAdvisor. So this lady, my friend, is working with them on TripAdvisor data since then, last 15 years. And why is she the top researcher? Because she has access to the data. So again, remember that these type of things can really give you ideas to work on things that not many people work on. And that's how you create your niche, like something that diff makes you different from other people. Okay, I'll just a couple of other examples that I have done, I will show you. These pictures are real pictures, okay? Real pictures. So this one on top in the red circles, you see these are two mouse, mice, okay? And this place is airport. This is Boston Airport's lounge. Okay. So I was going to Taiwan two years ago to teach. And then on the way, I had to stop in Boston. And um, I something moving near my seat very quickly. So I took this photo, obviously, because they were very quick. I couldn't take it very properly. But anyways, this is what it is. And then later, when I got on my flight from Boston to uh, Hong Kong. If you see here, this is my food, right? Um, it shows Muslim meal. 
um, it's a special meal. So normally if you travel, you know that they give special meal first, like first they serve special meals, Muslim meals or vegetarian meals or whatever, and then later they give it to everybody. So I got my food and then I look at my food and somebody bite it here. Uh, this bread, you see, somebody bite it and left it there. Uh, if you see this one, I was very surprised, like what's going on, right? So <laughs> I asked the, the, the air hostess and then she said, oh, okay, hold on. She, no, sorry, nothing. She says, just like, okay, hold on. Then she quickly ran. And she pick up one other bread with her hands, so no gloves, nothing, right? So she picked up another bread with her hands and she come take this one and put the other bread in my plate. So uh, I didn't eat it. Of course, I didn't eat it. But then when I came back, I was thinking about it and I thought like, how how come? The, and this airline is Cathay Pacific. So Cathay Pacific is one of the best airlines in the world, right? In terms of service and everything. So I was thinking, how, how did they do it? So I tried to look for some re reviews on TripAdvisor and here and there. And there are so many people who complain about bad service and that they are dissatisfied with them, right? So then I tried to look for some research and I couldn't find any research. Uh, there was no theoretical research on dissatisfaction. There's a lot of research on satisfaction where people feel that if you are... If your satisfaction is low, you are dissatisfied. But that's not true. If your satisfaction is low, you are not satisfied but it doesn't mean you are dissatisfied right no research and then ultimately and this with a paper about um, traveler dissatisfaction and misbehavior published in number one journal in um, tourism called journal of travel research right so this is one example of how this is my own idea and you know my own experience sorry then another one is like this. So one day I get, and this, if you look at the date, April 24, 2019, I was looking at my email and this is what I was telling you, hotel management, it's a magazine, right? So I was looking at it and this magazine was talking about how hotels are changing their lobbies um, for a better, you know, look and whatever. At that time I had a student, master student, Loana, and she was looking for her thesis topic so I called her to my office and then I asked her, Loana, what do you think about this? And she said, it's a good topic. Let's look at it, right? So we tried to look. There was literally no research on hotel lobby designs, like how hotel lobby designs look like, right? And then ultimately, we did a paper within a year um, or so from when we, not a year, actually nine or ten months after we looked at this article, this her thesis was done. And then this is number one hospitality journal, IJH, and maybe some of you know it. Uh, it was published there about the hotel lobby designs. Now, why is it that the previous paper and this paper got accepted in top journals so quickly? Because the topics are new. The topics are topics that not many people have worked on. And many journals that are on top, they are on top because of the impact factor. Right? So the, the impact factor is high, they are on top. Impact factor can only be increased if the citations are more. Right? which means that journals wants to publish papers that can get more citations. Which, which articles will get more citations? That the articles that are being worked on with new topics, topics that people are going to work on in the next few years, right? So the newer your topic is, the more citations you're probably going to get, and that's how journals would accept it. Do you all know Journal of Business Research? Yes? Journal of Business Research. Yesterday, uh, we had a social meeting um, with service management scholars and Journal of Business Research editor was in that meeting also, a uh, 45 minutes meeting. Um, and Anders said that this year, uh, till now, they have received more than 6,000 submissions, new submissions, not revisions, new submissions, more than 6,000, okay? Now, if you think about more than 6,000, how many can they publish? Maybe 300. So what happens to the rest of them? They're going to get rejected. So you need to be very selective with your talk. In fact, when we were having this talk on Zoom, he said that he rejected four papers during that 40 minutes. Uh, so, you know, again, make sure that you understand your topics. That is so, so important. Okay. Um, just two more slides very quickly. I'll just tell you how do I work with topics. So sometimes what happens is that if you look at something, maybe in a magazine or something like a very interesting idea, especially in your area, right? So let's say earlier somebody talked about um, 
um, somebody talked about SMEs, and I also see Jibran here. here. Uh, Jibran, how are you? Um, I, I see you. Yes, I, I see you. Jibran and me, we were, yeah, we were colleagues in, uh, in UK together uh, in, in the same university. So, um, yeah, so Jibran, I'm, uh, I know that he was also working in Dubai in uh, sales and in marketing and those areas, right? So, again, whatever your area is, if you are looking at magazines, industry magazines from that area, you would better understand the things that people are talking about in the, the magazines, right? Which of those things are already being ha happening, which are happening, which are new trends and stuff like this. The way I look at them is like this. So let's say this article I looked at, it's about green lodging and whatever. I look at it, then I think about only two things. How can it impact customers? Like how would customers feel about it? How is it going to change their behavior? What is it going to change in their perceptions and their attitudes and their behavior, right? So all of a sudden you think, how is it going to change people? The previous article I showed about the hotel lobby. So hotel lobby, they are changing, they are bringing more plants, more maybe waterfalls or something. In fact, last, uh, no, not last year, the year before I came to Malaysia to UCSI University and Cochin, they invited me. And um, the hotel that I stayed in, which is UCSI's own hotel, was unbelievable. They actually have a really big waterfall type of thing in the lobby. I don't know, maybe some of you might have seen it, um, but the sound is more like the ocean waves. Right? So many people only sat in the lobby to relax with that sound. So I normally think how it's going to change consumers' behavior and then try to come up with a model or something around it. Or the other way is to think about how is it going to change employees or something, right? So you can come up with some models and stuff, and, you know, I think that what you need to do is this, pick up something that you are really interested in as a topic, right? After looking at magazines, after looking at all these things, pick up something that you are very, very interested in. Then use it as an antecedent to something that you are not sure about. So let's say if I'm looking at hotel lobby design, I don't know how it's going to change things. So I use it as an antecedent, as an independent variable to see how it impacts employees' behavior or customer behavior or their emotions or their attitudes or something, right? In other ways, you, you can use it as a consequence of something. For example, I might be interested in these days, a lot of the people are talking about remote working, right? Many, many employees are going remotely working remote. Okay, so remote working is a good concept. So maybe I can use it as a consequence. What makes people think to go remote working? What makes people think that I should leave my job and work remotely, right? So it's a consequence and you think about things that can lead to it. So either use it as an antecedent or a consequence and then you can uh, proceed from there. This is a good example. When you book a hotel, Right? When, let's say you go to an um, online travel agent website or whatever, you want to book a hotel. So what do you do? You go to a website. These days nobody calls them, right? You go to the website and on website, how many of you check the photos of the hotel, right? The room or areas, you check the photos. So here I will show you two photos and these are real photos. So look at this photo and look at this photo. So do you see some difference? Right now, for some of you, maybe photo number one is attractive. If you only look at this, they, it may make you feel better. For some of you, photo number two might be better. Now, with people I talk to, those who say photo number one is good, they say it's good because it makes it look cleaner, it makes it look more pure, not dirty, or whatever, especially with COVID 19, <laughs> social distancing, and whatever. For people who like photo two, they think that, okay, I can look at it and it can make me feel what can I do there? Like I can also go to swim or it may give me an idea of how big is the hotel compared to these people. Or, you know, so people react to it differently, differently on if there are people in the photo or if there are no people in the photo. There's some discussion on it. And then just because of this, how many more things can you think of? What's the benefit of these photos? How do you, or why do you use it to go? Or how about if there are no photos and videos? How about if there are 360 degree photos where you can move it around just like in Facebook or other places, right? So there are so many more questions that you can bring it and work on it. And this is my good friends um, who did this paper again published. And this paper, if you look at the model, very simple. Size of the photo, 
Like, is it a small photo, like a thumbnail, or if it's an enlarged photo? If there are people in the photo or no people in the photo? That's it. That, that's the whole model. And this person who did this, this is a PhD thesis right in front of you. Why is it a PhD thesis? Because the concept that they work on is new. Nobody talked about it before. Even we use it, right? Every, for 10, 15, 20 years, people look at photos, but nobody have thought about working on it and understanding how it changed consumer behavior, right? Uh, here is my pure PhD example I'm giving you. What happened to my PhD? So in my PhD, consumer behavior, we all know that customer satisfaction leads to customer loyalty. No, right? Customer satisfaction leads to customer loyalty. However, it's not true. It's not true in all the cases. Like there's a reviews paper that says customer satisfaction is not enough to develop loyalty. Why? Because think about um, luxury consumption. Okay, luxury consumption, you don't want to buy it again and again, right? So there are cases or sometimes in travel, like let's say you go to one destination, maybe you go to Dubai, you like it a lot, but next time you would prefer to go to another place. Why would you go to Dubai again? Right, so, so this was the idea against my PhD thesis. So now the thing is this, let's say if satisfaction does not lead to loyalty, then what leads to loyalty? Right? This is the thought process. So when you want to come up with your topic, this is how you do it. Okay, now I am in a situation and this is exactly what happened with my PhD. Okay, so if lo if satisfaction does not go to loyalty, and actually there are research that says that 70% of satisfied customers are not loyal, then what leads to loyalty? So I, okay, what leads to loyalty? So then as a researcher, you have to think about it. So the best thing you can do then is find review papers in top journals. If people have done review papers, meta-analysis or things like this, that's the best thing you can do. This is a paper, right, about customer loyalty in hospitality. It's a review paper. So if you go to the end of this paper, they have at least 15 or 20 really good ideas about loyalty. Okay, maybe you should look at engaged customers impact on loyalty. So don't look at satisfaction on loyalty, look at engagement on loyalty. Look at customer commitment on loyalty. Look at customer to customer interaction on loyalty instead of satisfaction. So now, normally before this paper, I thought that, okay, only satisfaction leads to loyalty. Because this is how marketing literature is. Now, I see there are maybe another 20 things that leads to loyalty. So it gives me something new to work on. I already have a problem statement. I already have a gap statement. Now I already have a proper question to work with. Okay, so I'm going to stop here um, because uh, this is a lot of sharing. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to share some of my stories, but also give you an idea of how um, to work with. Right. So please um, tell me uh, if you guys have any questions, I can take some questions. No. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Hazan. Yes, yes. Uh, as you said that the topic should be new regarding the thesis or the paper. For example, if my topic today is new for my thesis, but after three years it won't be that new. So are you saying about the research paper it should be like new, new, or the thesis topic? Yes. So, Japan, it's a very good question. I think that when we say new, right, let me... Um, give you an answer with a question. So let's say that um, Jibran, if somebody would have asked you, do you know Fezan? Probably you would say yes, or probably you would so say no. But if somebody asks you, do you know Fezan Ali? Maybe then you have some clue. If they ask you, do you know Fezan Ali who studied with you in Glendor? Then you know like who is this person talking about, right? Remember one thing, the more things you add, the more complication it becomes, right? Like the more associations it can create. When we say that you should come up with a new topic, it's not only about maybe one or two new new variables because the way you work, maybe other people also work that way. 
that's why it's important that when you do your thesis, right? Pa- not paper. I mean, paper, it's easy. You can do a paper within three weeks or four weeks or a month or one and a half months, right? Paper, it's a different story. But when you work on your thesis, it takes two and a half to three years, right? And you want to make sure that it's current, it's up to date. And, you know, your examiners three years down the road should feel that it's a new thing, right? So there should be several levels. Several. One is maybe theoretical level where you can think about adding some new variables or whatever, blah, blah, blah. The second one is methodological level. Methodological level is where you think about something, maybe creating a new scale or maybe using a new technology or maybe using a new, sorry, not a technology, a methodology. Now, because these, there's, there's so much development and technology that it's very easy to use new methodologies. I will give you one example, and maybe some of you can think about it. Most of the research on consumer behavior, most of it, is based on self-reported questionnaires, right? Self-reported questionnaires. And normally, when you see thesis or papers, they say, okay, let's say if somebody is doing the research on theme park. Okay, I want to do research on theme park, and I want to see people's excitement in theme park, right? So what do I do? I say that I collected data from people who have been to a theme park in the last 12 months, right? Okay. Let's say I come to you, Jibran, I ask you, did you go to theme park in the last 12 months? You say yes. I say when? You say maybe last year in December, which is 11 months old. Now I ask you, tell me about your excitement. <laughs> what do you remember about your excitement? Nothing. So basically, you are not telling me your excitement. You are telling me your memory of the excitement. Right. So these days there are new technologies and very cheap. And I think many people have access to them. Uh, It's a headset like this one I'm wearing, which takes your brain waves. And basically what you can do is when somebody sits on a roller coaster, you just ask them to wear that. You don't do anything, no questionnaire, nothing. When they come out, you take their readings. It tells you how much excited they were, how much scared they were. So this is a new methodology of measuring excitement in theme parks. Nobody has done it. So if you do it, it's a new thing in your study because what you are saying now in this situation, if you collect data from 20 people, 20 people, this is much more valid than if you collect questionnaires from 600 people, right? So you have to think, how do you bring multiple aspects to make yourself much more unique, much more unique, right? So methodology and the third one which is the easiest to do the easiest is contextual contribution now the way uh, most of the phd students are trained is to make sure that your hypotheses are significant right so your hypothesis make sure it's significant if it's not significant everybody is worried oh my god what's going to happen right in fact my own younger sister she just did a research her three hypotheses were not significant she asked me is it okay So of course it's okay, this is your results. I mean, what can you do with it, right? What's important is to understand what's special about your context. So you need to write, if it's not significant, let's say, what is special about it? Why is it not significant? Why, What's, what's, what's going on, right? Another thing with context is this. Many times we know that when you do your hypothesis development, development, then at that time you write a lot of references about similar hypothesis from previous studies, right? But when after analysis you do discussion, you don't really refer to those previous studies. Most of the times people say my my hypothesis are in line with previous hypothesis or previous studies, or if it's not significant, you say my studies are contradicting previous studies, but you don't go why. That is actually where you can create contribution. If let's say your hypotheses are not in line, if it's contradicting, you actually have a very, very good opportunity to create contribution. Say what is special about your study? What is different in your study and the previous studies? Why? Right. Um, One example I will very quickly quote is, you guys know about Generation X, Generation Y, Generation Z, Millennials and all this, right? Do you think that millennials are the same all over the world? Do you think a millennial sitting in maybe California near Google um, headquarters is same like a millennial somewhere in, you know, in the rural areas of Pakistan near, I don't know, maybe Gilgit or some area? No, no access, no internet, nothing, 
right? It cannot be same. So now let's say you do a research on e-learning effectiveness. Previous research was all done in America and UK and Australia, Canada. Everything is good. Now you do it in Pakistan and many of your hypotheses are not supported. And then you just leave it there. No contribution. But if you explain what is different in your study, which is Pakistan, compared to all the previous studies, what is the difference between the respondents, those are well-educated, more internet, more blah, 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 you are actually really contributing to that theory. Okay? Okay. I think uh, we have taken enough time of Dr. Faison, and it is actually maybe midnight there. So uh, yes. I think we should not consume more time of him. And he already explained and shared a lot of valuable things that I think all of you can learn. Even I learned from him. Of course, it is like reciprocal learning has no limit. We learn from everywhere. It's just very insightful discussion, Dr. Faison. And I'll catch you later. And with that, I really thank you, not only from me, from all of my students. So I yes, wish you, you all the you. best. Thank, thank you. you. And just one thing very quickly. Thank you, everybody. I um, I really enjoyed it. I'll leave my email in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, drop me an email. Otherwise, if you are on my Facebook, you can obviously contact me through Facebook. Um, and I um, and then on my YouTube, I normally do Q and A sessions very often. So if you have any other questions, uh, do not um, you know hesitate to reach out. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Farzana, yeah. and good yeah, luck to all. So the kind of you that you given them your email address so that they can contact you if they have any question or something to share with you. Of course, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Good luck to everyone. Salam alaikum. Alaikum yes. salam. Bye bye. For uh, all of you, uh, the rest, please uh, come back at two o'clock sharp because we will have another speaker, of, of course, sharing about maybe his experience. So we, we, we will try to learn from others to this class because, you know, I know PhD is a lonely journey and we feel that sometimes because I was also students once. So we know that, you know, if we we'll hear from others, it gives us better understanding of the matter or we feel that, okay, I'm not alone. You know, there are many more people are in the similar stage and how they overcome their problem, how they look at the things. So, okay, so uh, I also take a break with all of you now, and I will maybe open the, you know, bar scanner again. Please, who didn't scan for today's class, come and scan. And come back at 2 o'clock sharp, okay? Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr.